Hey, Redeemer. Welcome back to the Weekly Pastor Bible Study. Good to see you. Um, I was going to do Psalm 136 for today, uh, but this week has brought a whole different set of need for the Psalms. And so uh, many of you know by now, but in case you do not, uh, one of our own uh, on staff, Audrey Dunsing Werner, her husband passed away on Sunday evening, actually Monday morning, uh, very early. And um, we are grieving with her as a staff uh, and as a church right now. Um, she's asked us to say that she is doing well. She is grieving by faith. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But um, number one, uh, Audrey, um, you are in our thoughts and in our prayers, and we are right here beside you all the way. Uh, next thing that we are going to just kind of nail out is instead of doing that high praise uh, psalm, I thought it was a good time to say, how do we handle hurt and pain and grief and death? And how do we take this moment uh, of Ron's passing into uh, an eternity with Christ uh, that does not know fear or tear or pain or whatever, but it's all left back here with us. Uh, and I know that some of you are experiencing all sorts of things, just hurt and pain all over the place too. So how is it that we actually deal with that as Christians in a way that's faithful, uh, in a way that is non-anxious, but in a way that looks to Christ and His redemption, His His hope, the, the future that we have that we're promised? How do we uphold that paradox of being joyful uh, because of what Christ has done for us, but also having grief and hurt and pain in the midst of that. How do we hold those two things in tension uh, as we are called to do faithfully by God? Uh, and so I want to take some time to do it. Uh, open up your Bibles to Psalm 77. This is where we're going to be today. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to do that uh, as you're opening up. If you have a translation that's a little bit different, not a problem. You can look it up. I use uh, NIV or ESV just depending on what the psalm is and how uh, good I think the translation is. So um, as we start, Psalm 77, verse 1. If you need to pause, go ahead and do that now while you open up. Otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and get moving on this. Here we go. Let's slow it down. Hear the grief uh, in Asaph's voice. Asaph is uh, the, the person who wrote this psalm. He says, um, I cried out to God for help. I cried out for God to hear me. Um, when I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked. And then we're going to get into what he asked here in just a second. Um, just a couple of things as we, as we start off this psalm. I want to, I want to show you uh, verse 1. It starts out with, like, how do we, how do we start our grieving? How do we do this thing called grieving? Uh, number one, um, calling upon the promise. He says, I, I cried out to God for help. I cried out uh, for God to hear me. Um, God will pay attention to me. That, that is essentially what the, the psalmist Asaph is saying. I'm crying out to God in the middle of the worst pain that I've been in ever because my God promised to hear me. And that's, the, that's his promise that he starts out with. We're going to understand why here in just a little bit when we, when we open up the rest of the psalm. But that first verse says, I'm calling out to God because that, that guy said he was going to listen to me in the middle of this. He's the one who made the promise. He's the one who said, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. I love you, Israel. I'm going to take care of you, Israel. I am like a father to children, Israel. You are my, you're my kids and I, and I want to take care of you. Uh, and you're hurting and you're in pain and I'm going to listen. That's what God is saying. Um, verse 3, it, it was, it's really interesting because it says, I remembered you, God, and I groaned. And sometimes when we look at that in English, it, it, it almost sounds like, I remembered you, God, so I groaned. Is kind of the way that our mind hears that in our vernacular. However, that's not the tone that it carries uh, in the original Hebrew. The original Hebrew, it, it, it sounds more like this, God, I remembered you while I groaned. Like, while I was groaning, I actually remembered you. And that reminds me of how Paul talks to the Thessalonians when he talks about death. Uh, he actually says these words, I don't want you to be in, uninformed or ignorant or stupid even, uh, brothers and sisters of the faith. Um, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. 
Uh, we grieve just like the rest of the world. That is a universal suffering that happens in the midst of a broken world. We grieve, but the thing that marks us as God's uh, people, as people He has said, welcome to my family, um, the difference is actually that we do it with hope. Why do we have hope? Again, we're going to unpack this uh, as we go. Look at verse 5. Um, one of the neat things, it says, um, I thought about the former days. This is where he started. He says, God, you're going to listen to me, and I am going to remember you while I'm groaning. Uh, I'm going to meditate, uh, and you kept my eyes from closing, and I thought about the former days. He wasn't even thinking about now and the pain and the hurt and the suffering that was going on. He's actually thinking about what happened. That's what God caused him to meditate on as he was grieving, as he opened up his heart and his mind to God, as he approached the throne of God saying, I'm hurting. That's what he meditated on. God opened his mind and his heart and said, okay, let's, let's look at where we've come from so that we know where we are right now. And as his heart meditated, um, you begin to see that he used the past moments. God was using this, this guy's past moments to navigate this one. And the reason why is because without those moments, you'd be lost. Um, when we go through hurt, when we go through pain, when we go through grief, uh, God has given us markers and milestones along our life to let us know, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, and even now I'm here. And that's what God is telling uh, Asaph in this, in, this, in this psalm as he's grieving. Uh, now, this is where it gets really interesting to me uh, because this is the part I think that people shy away from in grief. Uh, they just want to get to that point where it's like, I'm okay, God is with me, and I'm his child, and it's going to be fine, and I'm okay, and it's not going to be a big deal. No, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal to be dealing with grief and hurt and pain in life. And so this is what Asaph says. Listen to these. Uh, it's, it's actually six rhetorical questions. He says this, Will the Lord reject forever? Will He never show His favor again? Has His unfailing love vanished forever? Has His promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has He in anger withheld His compassion I mean, like, think about that. <laughs> Man, how many times have you felt like that guy? Like, God, are you listening? Are you hearing? Are you going to answer? Did your compassion or your love or your mercy, did you just say, no, I'm not going to give it now? What is going on? This is that guttural, almost from the depths and the bowels of the soul coming up, and he's just word vomiting in prayer. Now, I need you to hear this. He is spitting and spewing out all of these questions, knowing one thing. That's exactly what he needs to be doing because his God is big enough to hear it. He's not worried about God getting mad because he's asking questions. He's not worried about God smiting him because he's going through a hard time and is an emotional wreck. He knows that he, as a child to a father or a child to a good parent, can actually just spew and say, I don't get it. I don't understand. Where are you? What's going on, God? That's what he's asking in this moment. And these are things that we need to understand. And that's why even though it's hard to go through these psalms of lament like 77, like this one, it's also beautiful because it teaches us the nitty-gritty of life. And it says this, After I asked all those questions, then I thought, To this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out His right hand. So in all of those questions, He supplies an answer in verse 10. He said, There is true comfort in this. There is true healing in the middle of hurt and grief. But it doesn't lie within me. But in order for me to actually heal, I've got to take all of that brokenness and hurt and pain and let it out to understand that my help, that my hope, that my comfort as a child of God does not come from within me. It comes from the outside. It comes from God Himself who comes to me in my time of trouble, who comes to me in my time of distress. And that's why He said, I'm going to appeal to this when God outstretched His mighty right hand. Now, that outstretching of the mighty right hand has a very, very uh, specific reference. You see it all over the place when it talks about God rescuing His people from slavery. And that is what grief is. It is a spiritual, emotional, mental form of slavery. Uh, for some people, it's even physical. Uh, you just, it wrecks you all the way to, to, to your core, to where you can't function. 
It is a prison. And that is exactly how Asaph likens grief to uh, the world around him. He says, this is a prison. And so when we see this, he's appealing to this moment where God um, is, is saying to him, you can express your grief to me. You can express your hurt and your pain and your suffering. You, it's not shocking me that you're going through this. Everybody's going to go through this. I'm going to give you a way to go through this uh, where you will still have hope and you will have joy. And that's where Asaph is wanting to bring this uh, to the forefront. The true comfort and healing come from outside of us, not inside of us. That is why Christ comes, dies on the cross, rises on the third day to bring that hope right there. So Asaph gets a couple of things here that I think that our culture can miss the boat on. Not all the time, but we need to be reminded of it just because it is who we are. Uh, Number one, uh, I need to be emotional with God. Like, all the way. Not just telling God when I'm happy or I feel like I'm spiritually in alignment with Him, but even especially when I'm way out of alignment uh, with Him. When it feels like that, um, these are moments where I can be emotional with God, and it's okay. You don't have to worry about hurting God's feelings. You need to look at the true feelings that you're experiencing. Get them out in prayer. Just pour them out to your Father in heaven who loves you and knows you and will not leave you or forsake you. Man, I love this stuff. Uh, We're going to need to keep on moving. But I did say there were two things that Asaph got. Number one is the need to be uh, emotional with God. Number two is that self-help is a poor substitute for the real comfort that only God can give. Um, and man, isn't that the truth? I mean, how many times have you tried to take these self-help books or these self-help practices? And, you know, they help for a little bit. I mean, no, no, no doubt. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that when you want real help and when you want real lasting change, uh, most of the time it, it comes from without, uh, not from within. That is where God says, I'm here to bring it to you. And that's the grace of God is that he brings those moments to us uh, instead of us having to go chase them down. Now, again, Asaph hit his, hit his face and he laid out and he prayed and all of that. And he pressed in and he was knocking on the door uh, of the throne room. Uh, but our God is the one who delivered it. And so we need to remember that. Um, going into, this is what he begins to remember. And so uh, I'm taking these next two verses because they have a bunch of parallel uh, terms in them. I want you to hear this. Uh, verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. I want you to think about that uh, for just a second. Um, when it, basically what it's saying here, and I want to frame this out, is that when we're lost in our hurt and our grief, not knowing how to navigate it, the best thing that we can do is to reflect and to go to the place where we know something about God and how He operates. Um, so Asaph remembers and reflects on how God has operated uh, in Israel's history. Remember, Asaph is probably writing somewhere around you know, 950 to 1050 uh, BC. And so this is only within 400 years of the great Exodus, most, most likely. Um, but he's looking at this great freedom event where God took the Israelites and brought them out of uh, the bondage of slavery. Uh, and, and as we look at this, uh, we, we see that this is one of those moments that we just keep on going back to because there are these places in life where God just frees us from the prison that we're in. Um, and, and in this case, it is uh, the grief that Asaph is experiencing. Um, and, and, it's, and I want to say this, uh, suffering is universal. So, so there is not a person on this planet that has not experienced that, including our perfect, awesome, wonderful, risen Savior Jesus, who stood at the tomb of Lazarus and experienced great grief as he wept in front of the tomb. I mean, he also experienced great grief when he cried uh, while he was on the cross. And he said he cried out, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you... Why have you exiled me? Why have you forsaken me? Turned your back on me? Why am I uh, out here in this? And he's calling up Psalm 22, uh, which Pastor Kevin's going to be referencing this Sunday, by the way. Awesome Psalm uh, for the cross. You'll hear more about that later. Uh, But this is what we see, that Jesus wasn't an exception to the grief and the hurt. And so we can actually start making some identifying marks that say uh, Jesus actually prayed these psalms. Jesus knew that these psalms were going to be the uh, ones that we would call upon because this is what's in God's Word. He's actually praying. He's singing. He's taking these psalms and He's living them out in the midst of His own life. Uh, And so knowing that God uh, 
handled trouble in the past uh, is showing us what we can expect is essentially what uh, Asaph is saying as we as he looks to this. Uh, he's saying, if I'm going to understand how God is going to handle my grief and my hurt and my pain in all of this, I need to look at how he has handled things in the past. And so this is why it is so important, Redeemer, that we are in God's Word. So that when moments like this happen, we are continually reminded, not about our circumstance, because if we're just going to relegate ourselves to that, we're going to be in the middle of a whole mess, uh, because we're not going to be able to get ourselves out of our hurt, our pain, our suffering. Uh, However, this is why God wants us in His Word, because that Word comes to us and it reminds us of a God that we can call on a God that we can claim the name of, a God that we can say, I'm your child, and you said you were going to listen, and you said you were going to deliver. Do this, Lord, in the name of Jesus, do it. And that, that's why he says, I'm going to remember, I'm going to consider, I'm going to meditate. Some people would say, I'm going to reflect uh, on what God has done, and what I know about from Scripture is what I can expect God to do or to be for me or for my family in this moment. Now listen to how he unpacks this. Just verses 13 through 20 is where we're going to go. Hear these words. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display power, your power, among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. I love that. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. The thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Ah, there it is out of all of the chaos that they're talking about with this thunderstorm, tornado, this chaos that's going around with the weather. It says, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Now, isn't that interesting? Your footprints were not seen, but you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Okay. Man, we could probably spend an hour just on that. We're not going to. um, I'm going to encourage you to keep on pouring through that in your own devotion and meditation life. But let let me just break that down because I I condense that all into some really simple language. You are holy. You are great. You performed miracles. You displayed power. You redeemed people. You brought rain, thunder, lightning. You made sense out of the chaos. You made a path in the Red Sea. You led us through. And you used your servants as the leaders. Now hear those things. That's not about what we are doing to save ourselves. That is not what we are doing to get ourselves out of grief. That is not what we are doing to get ourselves into a right place with God or a peaceful place or a joyful place or a happy place or you put your pronoun in front of or your, your adjective, not pronoun, whatever. You're going to put your stuff in front of that and none of that has to do with your action. It's all about what God was doing We need to remember that. I mean, He is the one who meets us where we are at because He loves us. He's the one who came down from heaven to walk among us and to die on a cross and to rise on the third day. This is a God that is not surprised in the least by your pain. This is a God who knows everything. And for Him to look at you and say, Oh, I didn't know you were going to go through that pain when all that happened is ludicrous. He knows that we are going to face these things and He is prepared to handle it and to fight on our behalf. He is not shocked that we need Him. He is not looking at us and saying, man, you are so weak for not being able to do this on your own. That is not our God. That's not what He said. He's never said that. He said, when you're weak, I'm going to be your strength. When you're tired, I'm going to be your rest. When you're thirsty, I'm going to be your water. And when you're hungry, I'm going to be your food. I'm going to be everything that you need. Your need for me is not surprising. And I created you to be the receiver of my blessings and my gifts. And guess what? Here's another one. He is not exhausted at all by your pleas and your prayers. When you are hurting, when you are emotional, when you are just crying, screaming, kicking at God with all the things that are going on in your life, and it does happen, He is not exhausted at all by it. He's not impatient. 
I mean, if you look at the parable that Jesus tells about this uh, widow, she is looking for justice and she goes and she keeps on knocking at the door of this judge. And finally that judge says, fine, just it's going to be better if I just take care of this and uh, you're going to leave me alone, woman, is, is, is essentially what the judge says. And Jesus immediately follows that parable and he says, now, if you do that, think about what it's like for a God who actually wants to help you and wants to be your comfort and your healing. Like, he's not going to act like that. You go to him, he's like, I'm yours. I'm yours. Be with me. So um, the other part about this is that God is not, and that kind of leads into, God is not inconvenienced by your pain. He is not inconvenienced by your suffering or your hurt. Um, Our God is a God who is actually looking for ways and longing for the ways when you say, God, please help me. That's what He is doing among us. Uh, Last one uh, that I want to just bring out in front of you. Um, God doesn't suffer your prayers. He's not sitting there looking at His Apple Watch, as if God had an Apple Watch, but you know what I mean. He's not sitting there looking at His watch saying, okay, are you going to be done now? Because i got other things I need to do. He looks at you as a parent and He goes, man, I have got nothing better to do right now than to just be with you. And that's an encouragement for prayer. That's an encouragement uh, for how God views you and how God wants to spend time with you, that He is actually pleased with your prayers no matter their um, emotions that are behind it or the circumstance that's behind it. He says, I just want to spend time with you. I want you to know how loving I am toward you, and I want, to, I want you to know the comfort and the pain uh, that, that are uh, based, or excuse me, I want you to know the pain that is eliminated by my comfort. Does that mean that we're always going to get it immediately? No, but God says, I promise to be with you in that whole thing. And so that's what I want you to understand today, Redeemer, about this. Um, You can be brutally honest with God. You can get those emotions and those hurts and those pains out, dump it out, but don't stop there. We're not meant to stop there. We are meant to go the next step and saying, okay, I am hurting. I have pain. My God has hurt it. He knows it. And then just sit there and say, God, what have you done in the past? How have you treated your people? And then take comfort in knowing that in Jesus Christ, the one who embodies this whole psalm, that that Jesus is the one who died for you. That Jesus is the one who gives you uh, the, the knowledge that in the harsh realities of life, the beautiful reality that He is alive after He was crucified, um, It gives you hope. It gives you a stay. It gives you the ability to pray uh, to a God in the midst of your suffering. And that's exactly why Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, you as a follower of Christ, you can grieve like the rest of the world, but we do it with hope. So um, having said that, I'm going to pray for you. Uh, I hope that this has been a helpful a time in the Word. Uh, it went a little bit longer than what I was anticipating, but come on, Redeemer, you should know that that's going to happen by now. Uh, I love you. Uh, would you let me pray for you as you go about your day? Let's do this. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift uh, of grief. Thank you for the gift of hard times that drive us to you. Thank you for always being here for us, and thank you for letting uh, us express hurt and pain and grief uh, in ways that we have to be able to do it, Lord. And you know that, and and we are learning that. Thank you for being big enough to handle our pain and our hurt and our grief uh, and and our inexperience with how to handle things spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. Just thank you for being there with us. Uh, Thank you for our life and you, for our baptism, and for the comfort of your word that shows us exactly who you are, a father who loves us deeply. We pray for Audrey and for her family as they grieve the loss of Ron. Lord, uh, you have covered him in a robe of righteousness. He is now with you at peace and at rest. uh, And we long to be united as your people when you bring an end to all this mess and brokenness of this world. Lord, until then, keep us faithful. Keep us strong and sturdy in your word, knowing that you, Jesus, are our victory. We love you and we trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, Redeemer, God bless you. We'll see you next week with Pastor Kevin. 